Hello. Hi. You guys, I am excited to be here. She's right. I had to, to drive in early this morning. Um, had sick kiddos at home. I'm pregnant. I'm always pregnant. Um, so if I waddle, if I need to stretch it out up here, it's just a constant state of womb and board. I have two kids at home. Uh, a three-year-old who I'm 6'1", my husband's 6'5", P.S., smoking hot. He is my greatest blessing. Um, his name's Jeremiah, and he's incredible, but we're both huge. My three-year-old just turned three, and she's three and a half feet tall. I have a one-year-old who just turned one, and she's as big as a two-year-old. Uh, they were both 10-pound babies. This one's only halfway cooking, and it's large. And they were naturally birthed, so that's my greatest athletic achievement to date, outside of the athletic stuff. It's nothing to clap about. I limped for a month. It wasn't funny, and it's painful. But we're doing it. We love it. Um, we're just like a family of avatars roaming around Atlanta, and it's a blessing. It's a blessing because we get to... Um, do this somehow as an assignment from God, as a family, as a team. We get to travel the country and travel the world sharing the gospel. And it's incredible because you'll hear a little bit about it today, but as I look back at my life in college, in this very time, this was the season where I came to know Jesus in a really real, uh, really powerful way. I had grown up in the church. I was raised up you know, with wonderful, God-fearing parents, but it didn't mean that meant much for me, ultimately. It didn't become personal for me until several crazy big things occurred, a lot of adversity from identity issues and eating disorders to the unexpected suicide of my dad to a horrific car accident. All of these things occurred in this season when I was in college. And the way that I responded to these circumstances and the way that I carried myself and the way that I lived, not knowing whose I truly was, then circumstances redefining for me uh, my value, my worth, catapulted into depression, into anxiety, all of these things created a very different scenario that wouldn't really lead to stages speaking to people in the same season of life if it weren't for the grace of Jesus. That was the only factor in the equation that had the power to change everything. So right off the bat, I don't know where you are, I don't know any of you. God knows every single one of you. He knows every day, every chapter, every page of your story. I don't know what storms you're in. I don't know what justifications you have. I don't know what life looks like for you, but he does. And he intimately wants to walk with you because the power of what he wants to do with you is radically different, I would imagine, than the power of what you think is possible. So this truly is a privilege. I don't take it lightly. And they also gave me 25 minutes. And I'm extremely long-winded. So I'm going to be talking so fast that I need you to hang with me. But I want us to open up in prayer before we jump in because... What does scripture say? That the, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And so I could stand up here and speak the most eloquent words and be clanging bells if the Holy Spirit's not present. If there's not power in this place to translate the words to your heart, then you'll keep doing your homework or you'll roll your eyes or you'll tune out or we'll walk out of another day in chapel and it'll, it'll just go as another sort of thing in our in our wheelbarrow. Where's this metaphor coming from? I don't know where it's going. Who carries a wheelbarrow? But our wheelbarrow of good works, and we're like, maybe that'll count for something. And it doesn't count for much of anything if we don't have a relationship with Jesus. So it has to be the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in. God, we just um, welcome you into this place, Lord. You are good. You are holy. You are powerful. You are full of authority. You are mighty to save, yet you know us, you see us, you love us, you're intimate and you're kind, God. We just invite you into this place, lift your name above all names, and I ask, God, that you move and that you speak by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. I ask that you move me out of the way, that these words be yours, and that you do what only you can do in ministering to these souls that you care so deeply about. God, we love you. We commit the time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm always pregnant because I like to talk about sex, and also I have it in marriage. And it's great! It's great in marriage. 
Um, it's what I'm passionate about. I'm serious. My book is available for sale, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot. Talk about making Baptists blush. Release a book like that. And we would act like we had no idea that God and sex are even sort of in the same arena. God is the inventor of sex. He's the inventor of sex. He's the one who made it. He's the one who had plans and purpose for it. There's some Baptists in the room who are like, why would she say that? I can hear you shuffling. They're like, sorry. But God is the one who invented sex. Sex is actually, if we look at the holy word, a gift given to us by God with parameters, with instruction around us. It's actually an act of worship to God. Have we ever heard sex talked about in these words? It's an act of worship to God, actually in marriage, a weapon against the enemy in his schemes to divide. It's an incredible, beautiful, unifying, powerful gift that God is not playing around with. But we live in a world that sex has been stolen, cheapened, twisted, perverted, idolized worship. What does scripture talk about? The fact that we worship the created over the creator. We live in a world that has taken the sanctity of sex and defiled it, really. And it's entertainment and um, it's, it's without, it's compartmentalized conscience. We want to walk the walk and say that we're a Christian, but our sexual decision making feels different. I say all this with some sense of authority because I was an absolute mess. My sexual backstory and narrative was one of confusion and pain and brokenness. And I didn't even realize those things until I came to know Jesus, until I saw the truth wrapped around it, and until my heart lit on fire for a generation that the enemy has so deeply deceived. And a generation that's wounded, a generation that's crying out, hashtag me too. A generation that has pain associated with something that was always intended to be a good gift from God. A generation that carries shame around something that was always meant to be an act of worship. A generation that's sort of just walking by the world's maze of guess as you go, figure it out. This is the definition this day and it changes this day and it's Pandora's box of a lack of absolute truth and a generation that is blindly fumbling around trying to figure things out, either puffed up in pride or silenced by shame, neither of which are of God. And my heart breaks for the generation because that was me too. I was in it too. And we see really this sin even creep in all the way back in Genesis. God has a lot to say about sex all through his word. We think they're disassociated. This is like a Jerry Springer episode of drama and exciting nature. Get to Leviticus, things get real weird. Then get into the New Testament, see God speak directly and powerfully into all things sex to redefine it for our hearts if we would care to lean in and understand. He gives us a source, never changing, never failing truth about who we are and whose we are and what's intended for our lives, no matter what we want to rationalize and no matter where our rebellion leads us. But we see it right off the bat in Genesis, what happened. We see that the sin in our life, so sexual or otherwise, often creeps in not because we wake up one day and we've been chaste and pure and walking out holy lives and we're like, you know what, today's the day. I'm gonna sleep with 12 men and we just go rogue. That's not usually how the sin pattern looks in our life, except for a few of you freshman year and things got weird real fast. <laughs> and it was a hard turn, but God's faithful to redeem that too. But most of the time, they're like, she knows Stephanie. I don't know Stephanie. I don't know any of you. This is just the reality. Y'all, I gotta tell you something. Sometimes I'll just throw out names because it's weird what God will do. One time I was speaking to this church, it was like maybe 45 people, very small gathering. And I'm giving this word on Jesus calling Mary's name at the tomb and how it opened her eyes to the resurrected Lord. So I'm like, whose name is he calling? Is it David? Is it Steve? Is it Carol? And then my, bl my brain just went blank and no name would come to my mind except Tabby, like a tabby cat. 
And I was like standing there just mute. And I said, I'm so sorry. This is so weird. The only name coming to my mind is Tabby. And I, I know that seems silly. And this woman literally cries out, my name is Tabby. Tabitha, of all things, this woman's name really was Tabby. Got saved. It was crazy. It was a great day. So if I call out a name, Stephanie, I don't know. I don't know you. But God's done it several times. So the reality is sin usually creeps into our life because we choose to choose for ourselves what's best for us. This is Eve in the garden. This is where the fall entered man, is that there was a little bit of temptation from the enemy to say God had given Adam and Eve everything that was good. He'd given them instruction, be fruitful, multiply. He spoke it into sex right off the bat. He's tied it together with their image-bearing identity as creatures made to worship in the image of God with inherent value, inherent worth, inherent purpose. And then the enemy creeps in with a teasing lie who says, well, well, surely God might be withholding something from you. Surely you won't die. The consequences won't be too bad. Why don't you choose for yourself what you think is best for you? And we see Eve sin. Sin enters the world. She chooses to choose for herself, and things shift. And many times that's what it looks like in our life. It's the small, early decisions of choosing what we want, what we like, what our flesh wants, what we think is best for us. And we choose to choose for ourselves. And then it just can become kind of a stairwell until we're so far gone or into it or confused. The shame just silences us. Or, or we continue to be puffed up in pride and live out a different narrative, though we know we're unsatisfied when we wake up Sunday morning and somehow we're here, even though it all didn't, we don't know where it started, where it's sourced from, but usually it's sourced from the small decision of choosing to choose for ourselves. And so what happens in the garden? God enters and he calls them out and we sort of cast blame. It says that Adam and Eve hid in shame. They immediately hid in the shame of their action, in the shame of their sin. They didn't want to be seen. You see, we as image-bearing creations of God, made by a creator, deep down long for true intimacy, yet we're unwilling to be naked and exposed at the heart level many times with God, so we opt to be naked and exposed at the physical level with man, with woman, which never quite leaves us satisfied. You see, Adam and Eve's response was to separate from God in shame. They didn't want that exposure. Sin entered in and we found separation and we've blindly navigated our way around trying to lord our own lives since. For me, it started small it started as the small decisions of figuring things out and interest in some things. I'll never forget coming down to my mom's bedroom uh, when I was in like elementary school and I'd been given an, a project. And this is a great mystery of man. Nobody Google it. You won't be able to find the answer. No one knows this answer, but I came down to my mom's room and I was doing a project on snake, snakes. And my question was, how do snakes have sex? No one knows! It's a great, literal, physiological mystery. And so I came down to ask her how snakes had sex, and I think in the course of a few minutes of conversation, the words that started coming out of my mouth probably terrified her because what she didn't know was already at that age, at eight years old or at nine years old, our neighbor Natalie, who was older than me, had taken me down to the creek, the fort in our neighborhood, and told me everything there was to know about sex, all things everything. I didn't ask Natalie, but I was debriefed at nine about all things sex. And what she didn't even know was prior to that, I had opened the, the truck door of my dad's truck one day and a playing card had fallen out of like the wads and papers stuffed behind the seats. And I bent down to pick it up and put it back in the car. And it was a novelty poker card that was porn. And at eight years old, and some of you guys remember this moment in your life more clearly than you would like to admit, at the first sight of true sexual perversion, it seared something on my heart. I can remember it as clear as day still. 
and I couldn't figure out why I was seeing this when my mommy was in the house there, and my daddy, this was my daddy's, and he was coming around in the truck, so I shoved it back in there, and the shame was overwhelming, and the breathlessness, and I tried for a few days to forget what I'd seen, but the curiosity ultimately grew, that shame, that tension ultimately grows into curiosity, and so I started to seek out those things. What was that that I had seen? Why did it make me feel this kind of way? It looked kind of powerful, kind of beautiful, and at eight years old, I started a decade-long addiction to porn. Oh my God, a woman on stage just talked about porn. Yeah, guys, in 2016 alone, in one calendar year on one pornographic website, we as a people consumed 4.6 billion hours of porn. That's 524,000 years. It's 17,000 complete lifetimes in one year on one website. If we think it's solely unsaved males contributing to the porn statistics, then we need to wake up, church. It's the saved, it's the unsaved, it's males, it's females. The average age of exposure to porn is nine years old right now. That's the average age. That's the average. You hit the wrong hashtag on Twitter, one in five cell phone searches are for porn. Come on. It's the vast majority of us in this room turning to these things. Some of us can't help it anymore, actually. Some of us, it's the only arousal we can even get in this department, and it's messing with our minds. It's distracting our vision. It's twisting our hearts, and we look around and see a world that says it's normal. It's entertainment, and I look and see a word that says it will be the decimation of your soul. It will tear you down piece by piece, and it tore me down. I started seeing those things as the image of power and beauty. Maybe that is what I needed to be like. That started to kind of define my worth. I wanted to be seen as beautiful and powerful like that. So I started pushing the envelopes, waving the Christian virgin banner. And in the darkness, it's like, okay, so how far is too far? So like, what does virgin mean? And then what can I do? And then how can I push the envelope? And many of our questions in here, when we're honest and we sit down at the end of the night, it's like, okay, so how far is too far that the reputation isn't built or I don't go all the way? And God's like, the question I want you to be asking is how close can you draw near? You're asking the wrong question. But we rationalize and I pushed the envelope and gave pieces of myself away found myself in an 18-year-old's car as a freshman in high school, clueless of what was going on and going further than I needed to. In college, you see your dad's body on a morgue table with a bullet hole through his chest. Adversity, your pain, your circumstances will be one of the biggest catalysts into your sexual promiscuity because we will seek any sin-sized piece to fill the God-sized hole in our heart. We'll want to numb it, and it'll only leave you emptier and emptier College, I had a reputation I built, a name for myself in all of these areas. And I remember in recovering from everything with my dad, one night I was out at a party because don't we mask it with the alcohol and the partying and we don't even know who the heck we are, but maybe if for a weekend we can have a good time, we'll be somebody to somebody. And you wake up Monday just as clueless as to who you are. I'm being really harsh, I'm sorry. I just am a little fire and brimstone, but it's because I wish someone would have said it to me in college because it was the truth. And I woke up after partying one night hungover, replaying the night before in my head, and I realized, wait a second, there was that guy, and when we were out at the bars, I could have cared less. I didn't even know he was rolling with our group, and someone mentioned he was separated, or was he divorced, or is he still married? And then fast forward into the kitchen earlier or later in that evening, and I know that I was involved with him physically, and so am I an adulteress? Is adultery now a part of my story? How did I, the well-meaning church girl, Good grades, good school, all-American athlete, uh, whatever, SEC academic honor roll. It's not a whatever. That's so important. I hope you make the honor roll academically. <laughs> but whatever. Oh, how did I? This girl suddenly have a scarlet letter adultery written over my story, suddenly confused about my identity, overwhelmed in my sexual brokenness, faking it till I make it, living my life, proclaiming that I'm a Christian, going through the motions, acting it out, but struggling like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in my heart. Silenced by shame, 
afraid to be exposed. Heaven forbid someone found out about that. Y'all, we are so ignorant to think that the things we do in darkness won't come to light. We pervert privacy, don't we? Oh, it's my right to privacy, and that's just what we do. And we've perverted privacy. It's darkness. And the enemy says, that's your place. That's your thing. That's fine. Figure out the whole sexual maze there. And We're hurting, and I was hurting, and it was dismantling my heart. Because since the beginning of time, beginning of the fall, we've hidden ourselves in shame from God at the revelation of our sin, at the fear of exposure. We busy ourselves and try to fill the void when in actuality, all that matters is at the end of the day, we will stand before God, every single one of us, and he will search our hearts. You're like, I don't want to wrestle with what's in here. That's why I go there. That's why it's the new girl every weekend. That's why I come back together with my boyfriend. We're in sexual sin. We're even living together. Most people don't know, but this is why, because this fills a void, and I would rather just feel the intimacy here than have to really sit in intimacy with God where he would search my heart and he would see the root of the hard stuff, the confusion, the pain, the bent-hearted proclivity towards sin that... I don't even really want to admit is within me. And we struggle, and we don't want to really be seen. And we fake that we're fine, and we wear the masks. But here's what's startling to me. And when I came across this scripture, it was like a punch in the gut, and it is for many of us. And usually you probably thumb past it because you don't want to deal with it. But Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, no, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoer. And this is what I see in our generation. We want to, 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 to proclaim that we're following Jesus, we, we're at the Christian school, we're in the divinity class, we're showing up for Bible study, we're there on Sunday, and yet we're addicted to porn behind a computer screen. We're in the throes of sexual sin in the darkness in hopes that people won't see it. We lack self-control. We see human beings as body parts made for our pleasure rather than image-bearing creations of God. The overstimulation has desensitized us to the humanity of sex. We don't even know what God actually has to say about sex because mostly we're biblically illiterate if we're being honest. And we say, but wait a second, Lord. Didn't you see I was at the Christian university? Didn't you see the good works that I did? Didn't you see we cast out demons, we prophesy? Have any of y'all cast out a demon lately or prophesied? These people are really have an argument to make before the Lord. And he says, but I never knew you. I never knew you. You never let me in to search your heart. Jesus didn't just come and take the cross so that we could cope. Jesus came and took the cross to set the captives free. And some of you guys are walking captive to your sexual sin, enslaved to it, really. Again, I say this from the place of learning every hard lesson, every hard way, and having to process for years through the healing of it all. And God is faithful again. My husband is a dime. But it was a work. It still is often a work. And the truth is that at the end, we'll all stand before him. And he will search the motives of our heart is what scripture says. And I don't want to see a generation anymore that's like living for behavior modification. I want to see a generation that actually understands that what God cares about is heart transformation. Oh, I'll do better. I'll try harder. I'll move out of this. And then for whatever reason, I'm back into the throes of it. And it's the roller coaster ride of guilt and shame. And I don't hear God and I don't feel him and I don't see. We're separated from him trying to modify our behaviors when he says I want to transform your heart I want to transform your heart because what the word says is that pure actions pour out of a pure heart impure actions pour out of an impure heart he wants our heart 
1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5, it's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. I'm running out of time. I swear I'll wrap it, but here's the beauty. Because just to say, let God search your heart, let him point out all those different things, we're like, get off the stage, lady. No. Oh, but you know what I love that's different between Eve in the garden choosing for herself and the whore at the well in John 4? We know this Samaritan woman, yes? She's a whore by all accounts. Is that this person with a sexual backstory, a list of shame a mile long, certainly feeling disqualified, and some of you, y'all are in this whole series right now of fearless, and your greatest fear is that somebody will find out the sin you're in in the darkness, and your greatest fear is the fact that you feel disqualified from being used by God, that surely his grace has run out, that surely you know he sees what's going on where it shouldn't be, and you're afraid that things are done for you because you've sought the grace, and then you've gotten, and then you've messed up again, and it's the roller coaster ride. But here's what I see with the woman at the well is that this is a woman with a reputation, a backstory, and men, this goes for you too. This is a person with sexual brokenness that is permeated through their story. Out at the well at high noon because she doesn't want to be seen by anybody, and that's where Jesus encounters her. And he steps past everything that's taboo, everything that's cultural, every stigma, and he speaks to her, and he wants to speak to you. And what he does right away is he draws up her sexual sin. Go get your husband. Y'all, Jesus is mildly sassy. I don't know if you've read the word frequently, but he's got a little spunk. And he's like, go get your husband. And she's like, I don't have a husband. And he's like, son of man, I know. You've had five And the man you're married to now, or the man you're living with now, you're not even married to. And Jesus encounters this person and drums up their sexual sin and calls it all out and put it right before them. And this is what I love so much about the Samaritan woman is she is there face to face with someone who knows everything about her, who sees her heart, who's able to pull up the ragged roots But what makes it different is in the face of her filth, he stays. And he offers her living water that she would never thirst again. We're a thirsty generation, if we're being honest. And we need to meet a king who offers living water that we would never thirst again. And what I love about her is she doesn't run off in shame, denial. That's not me. You got the wrong chick. High noon. I just had a tough day in morning with the kids and I couldn't get out till now. She, we don't come with excuses. She doesn't come with, with, with guilt. She doesn't run off in shame. She doesn't hide her face like Adam and Eve hid in the shame of their sin. She says, who are you that you would know everything about me? And he's like, I'm the Messiah, the one who's come to save. And the woman at the well is the first person in the holy word of God who Jesus gives explicit permission to, to evangelize. If you read the gospel, he's performing miracles, raising the dead, just an average Tuesday for Jesus. But he's telling everyone, don't tell anyone what I've done. He's meticulous in the release of his ministry. And it's not until he encounters the person with a sexual backstory, the addiction to pornography, the promiscuity, the slave to sexual sin, the self-worth dismantler because you don't think you measure up, the puffed up pride one with the list a mile long, that's the person who Jesus encounters and said, would you take living water? And that's the person who Jesus transforms their heart and compels into evangelism. The woman at the well doesn't run off in shame. She runs off into evangelism. She runs back with another man's name on her lips, but this time it's the name above all names. It's the one that's mighty to save, and hundreds come to believe in response to her faithfulness. So this is my commission. This is my hope and my cry for this generation that we would redirect our fear, that it wouldn't be of being exposed or of being seen or of people finding out or heaven forbid we have to seek accountability or heaven forbid we have to, have to share or be vulnerable or actually be authentic human beings, 
that we would shift our fear, our anxiety, our depression, our weight as we are living under the weight of sin to a righteous, reverent, holy fear of God to say, if I'm going to have fear in my heart, it will be of the king of all kings, the one who has my mind, my body, my heart, my soul in his hands. It will be the king of all kings who I will stand before. And I want to stand at the end of my days in confidence. I want to stand before him, not unfamiliar familiar with being in his presence and having him search my heart. No, I don't want to waste time in this life chasing after the guy or chasing after the girl or swiping on Tinder. Never done Tinder in my life. I don't know which way is the good swipe, which way is the bad, but there's a lot of swiping. I don't want to be that. I want to be set apart, a holy generation. I want to live a life that's pleasing to him. I want him to search my heart now and keep searching it and the Holy Spirit keep transforming me so when I stand before him, I don't stand in fear. Yeah, I have a past, but I also have a grace that changed everything and a testimony to be shared. In response to a hashtag me too world, then I'll say hashtag me first. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Teach me your commands that I may walk in obedience and in faithfulness. See me and search me. I won't hide from it anymore. And whatever your story looks like, he's faithful to do it. Take it from the bulimic, suicidal, fathered, depressed, anxious, promiscuous, reputation-carrying, adulteress, addicted to porn, who can stand in confidence and say it is worth it to wrestle through the hard but holy heart work. And he does not see you as disqualified. He wants to use you for the plans and purposes he always wrote over your life. I want to see men rise up in this generation, men of God. I want to see women rise up in this generation with dignity and self-respect. I want to see brothers and sisters rise up, honoring one another, seeking after the kingdom, and actually practicing what we preach, because faking it is exhausting, but walking in truth is freeing. And when we'll stand before him, it'll be familiar. Because we always let him search our heart in this time. I killed my time limit. You're all going to be late for class. I'm sorry. We'll wrap it up really fast. Dear Lord, we thank you. We ask for grace from the teachers that we would not be late and tardy. Lord, we just thank you for who you are, that you speak to us, that your Holy Spirit speaks and ministers truth. God, I ask that eyes would be opened, minds renewed, hearts would be transformed at your truth. I ask that you would spark a hunger over this room for the truth of God in your word. I ask that you would spark a vulnerability over this room to let the guard down and stop hiding and instead step into a place of true faith where we ask God to search our hearts to purify us, to sanctify us, to make us into the image of Christ. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we want freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>